You're listening to the Study Legal English podcast, the world's first legal English podcast, helping lawyers and law students become fluent in legal English. Hello and welcome to the Study Legal English podcast. I'm Louise and today I'm really pleased to be joined by David Best. Hi, David. Hello, Louise. Thank you for having me. Thank you. So David is the president of ULITA. And for those of you who haven't heard of ULITA before, it's the European Legal English Teachers Association. And it's a non-profit organization which promotes the professional development of legal English teachers. It's got members in pretty much every country within Europe and even beyond that. So a brilliant organization. And as well as that, David coordinates and teaches English for Law courses at the, I'm going to try to pronounce this, but David might have to help me, at the Universita Libre de Brussels. Okay. How um, do you pronounce that? Université Libre de Bruxelles. Okay, that's much better. Tell me, first of all, about how you became involved in legal English. Uh, well, it was a, a long and winding road, I think, like many people who end up in this profession. I'd actually taken a degree in European studies and French and Italian language and literatures, mm -hmm. and uh, then specialised with a PhD in Italian literature and found myself teaching Italian language and literature for, for quite some years in, in Irish and Scottish universities. Then the opportunity came up to move to Italy, and I moved to Naples, I think it was in 2009, and had to shuffle around my skill set and uh, reassess what I was able to do to put bread on the table. So I found myself in a department of cultural studies and, and interlingual communications, teaching rather than Italian, teaching English for translation studies and interlingual communications. So using the knowledge of Italian language and linguistics and culture, obviously, but to deliver English courses to students who would go on into that field. Then uh, another opportunity came up in Brussels. I moved to Brussels for a few months in 2010 to work in one of the secretariats of a political group in one of the institutions. And from that, then again, I was in the right place at the right time. A job happened to be coming up in English teaching in one of the university faculties. And I wasn't fussy. It happened to be law. I had no background or history teaching in, in a law faculty before and uh, applied for it and got the job. Mm -hmm. And that was in, in 2011. And I've been there since. So that's how I got into it, by mistake or by destiny or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, but I guess a solid background anyway in, in language teaching and language instruction right from the beginning of my degree. And that's, that's how it, it led me there. So I've been coordinating the course. Obviously, I started from scratch. It's built up over the years and it seems to be going well. Uh, so you've talked a little bit about your work at the university. Do you have any other points about it? Like, how did you build up your materials? I imagine that you had to spend quite a long time planning and things like that. Well, I found myself in an unusual situation because I was the sole teacher of English in quite a big law faculty, which was unusual because other faculties in the same university, for example, business and marketing, would have a team of up to 15 teachers mm -hmm. and they'd all be developing course books together and, and team teaching and so on and so forth. So whilst all that was going on, I had to sort of draw on their support a little bit or, or look at how they were doing things and try and apply that to the law degree. Obviously, being the only teacher meant having big classes. So I was dealing with large numbers of students right from the beginning. So I had to adapt material to be able to deliver to, to a large audience and also develop exams and assessment material in such a way that one teacher could cope with up to 300 or more assessments coming in a couple of times a year without being overwhelmed by it. Not having any immediate colleagues in legal English in, in Brussels wasn't a problem though because I quickly looked outside and I started trying to get in contact with other people in a similar position in, in other European universities, having done the rounds a bit of, of universities in, in Britain and Italy and, and so on. That wasn't too difficult. 
it all began with an Erasmus teaching mobility exchange, actually, when I went to the Czech Republic, mm. um, I think in my second year teaching in Brussels. And I had a fantastic time. I, it was a real eye-opener uh, working with a team of legal English teachers in, in Masaryk University in Brno. And they are the ones that put me in contact with Julita. And my first contact with Julita was, in fact, at a workshop in Groningen in, in the Netherlands in 2013, I think. And from there, I quickly tapped into this network of uh, legal English teachers, many of them in, in similar situations to me, um, you know, working alongside business English teachers and, and other ESP fields, but in law, not, not quite, you know, having, having the support that other fields gave. So Ulita has really sort of grown up together as this kind of horizontal team that spreads across Europe, but we know that we can call on each other to, to have a check, you know, of an exam or, mm -hmm. you know, to say, what do you think of this, this type of uh, course assessment that I'm doing? So my teaching team isn't in Brussels in the university where I'm employed but it's actually across the whole of the continent of Europe and and that's how, mm -hmm. how I gain my support and bounce ideas off people. And what sort of courses do you teach or do you want to speak a bit more about the courses that you teach at the university? Mm -hmm. um, yeah okay well the year that I uh, was taken on at, at Brussels University coincided with the first year that the law faculty decided to introduce compulsory English course for law undergraduates. Mm -hmm. So almost all of my teaching is targeted at second year law students, undergrads. And we use a textbook. Can I mention the textbook? Yes, yeah, of course. <laughs> it's um, Introduction to International Legal English. Mm -hmm. And obviously one of the co-authors is Matt Firth, who also happens to be on the ULITA board mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. again after many years, having been one of the original board members early on. So we base the course around the units in that book. Um, as you probably know, it goes through the different areas that people typically study in, in an undergraduate law degree. But onto that, I tend to graft lots of other material coming from journalistic sources, academic sources, all different kinds of sources. So it's a very kind of eclectic course based on that infrastructure, but very hands-on in the sense that much of the course revolves around the students uh, engaging in a practical work project themselves. One thing in particular that, that uh, Yulita has, has helped me is in my international connections with other teachers of, of legal English, obviously. But in particular, we've, we've managed to set up Erasmus teaching mobility agreements um, between our faculty in Brussels and a few faculties in Europe, in particular Masaryk University in Brno, Czech Republic, uh, Jagiellonian University in Krakow in Poland, and the most recent one is with the law faculty in Osijek University in Croatia. And um, a spin-off of these uh, teaching mobility exchanges, which essentially is where you know we, we go for five days and, and teach for, for a few hours over the course of the week and join in um, research workshops and, and exchange materials and ideas and teaching practice and so on, is uh, in fact a project which we ask our students to get involved in, and that's a project which we've called virtual Erasmus because it's like they do an Erasmus experience but without actually traveling. They do this Erasmus experience online um, and we set this task for the students to do. So let's say two students from my class in Brussels will join up with two students from my colleague's class in Brno and two students from my other colleague's class in Krakow and they will form a group on an online platform, the Moodle platform, and carry out a case study collaboratively, collectively, over the course of a couple of months, going from a very sort of basic beginning, just describing through a case brief what the case, the judgment is that they're going to analyse, and then working through all the different steps of an analysis of a case or a judgment. So going through the facts, the procedural history, the legal issues, the reasoning, how both parties were represented, and then drawing on the fact that they're all from different jurisdictions, providing a kind of comparative law summary of the judgment from the 
Belgian perspective, from the Polish perspective and from the Czech perspective on a case which is usually one that has been heard in the, in the common law system. So it's usually a, a US or a, a UK case or Australian or any other English speaking jurisdiction. So this virtual Erasmus project has really had very positive knock-on effects for our students because they go through the whole intercultural exchange experience practicing their English, doing an authentic activity, you know, it's the task-based learning approach because writing a case brief is something that I think, you know, junior lawyers will have to go and go on to do out in the real world and all the while networking and opening themselves opportunities for the future um, and so on. Good, okay, so we've mentioned you, Lita, a little bit and um, you've talked about how, uh, you know, it provides this brilliant network for you as a legal English teacher a network of lawyers or simply people who are working teaching uh, legal English around mm -hmm. Europe. Can you tell me a little bit about your role as the president? How did you come to be the president? What do you do? How does the organisation work? Well, like you said correctly, ULITA is very much uh, an association that exists pretty much with the, the main objective is to network. I mean, you know, networking is often incidental or, you know, happens by because the lunch is organized in the context of a bigger event. But ULITA really is about networking. You know, we've often sat down as a board or even, you know, at the AGM and looked at ourselves and thought, you know, should we do, be doing more or should we be doing something else? But then the feedback always always comes in that, you know, no, what we're doing is, is just about right. And the very fact that a network exists is, is really what these sort of isolated legal English teachers out there in, you know, small town language schools or working on their own in going in-house training lawyers um, in big firms or in universities. The service that we, we provide is really about providing the, the gel to, to mm -hmm. link all these people in, in this network. I mentioned before my first contact was in 2013 simply as a participant at a at a workshop not a presenter but a, a participant goes to take notes and okay. learn things audience member audience member in in Kroningen and it was such a warm welcome and this is the one of the key features about ULIT it really is a you know, without sounding, you know, sound not like a serious organization, but it really is a big family. People are genuinely happy to see each other and help each other out. And I think the fact that we've mutually supported each other on different occasions really, yeah, it, 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 it deepens together. the bond. Um, and it's a very enduring bond. I think it was the year afterwards that the, the president at the time um, and the board, uh, along with Mark Brophy, of course, suggested the idea of country reps. And this was to increase activity a little bit, not necessarily by doing more things, but just to sort of thicken the network mm -hmm. somewhat and provide a kind of link between the board, who at that time were Germany-based until Mark Brophy joined the, the board in about 2014. Before that date, they had all been in Germany. And this is because the organization originated in Germany, mm -hmm. okay? But, it, you know, it took a little while to move out. So Country Reps was the project from, from 2014, and I was invited to become the, the Country Rep for Belgium. And so I said, yes, I was very happy to do that. You know, I tried to be as active as I could, um, alerting the board to events that were happening in Belgium and alerting, you know, local language teachers in Belgium to what was happening in ULITA and mm -hmm. other European language teaching centres. And then, of course, uh, along came 2016 and uh, the AGM was due to happen September 2016 and uh, the election of a new board. The president of the time was, was standing down. She had, she had done her two mandates. They were looking for candidates for the future president and uh, a couple of people on the board were sort of, sure. About, would you like to? It's like, no way, no way. I mean, I'm, I've only, I'm only a fledgling member. But I thought about it and, um, you know, over a few months, I thought, gosh, you know, this, this association has been good to me and uh, it's, it's done good things for me. And I do feel very much involved in it. And, you know, if I wouldn't get more involved in this, what would I get more involved in? It seemed to make sense. So mm. I, I went for it and, and so I was elected president mm. in the Winterthur Conference 2016. 
And a whole new board was elected on that occasion, in fact. Uh, the only constant board member was, was Mark Brophy, who carried over from the previous board. But otherwise, the board went from being almost entirely Germanocentric to totally scattered across Europe, which was our aim as well, because it really reflects the spread and the, the way that Ulita has grown. So we have two board members in Austria, one in Switzerland, one in Italy, myself in Belgium, and then one in Poland. You mentioned earlier about you, Lisa, seeming a bit like a, a family. And I have to say, I only recently, towards the end of last year, joined you, Lisa. And uh, I have to say that every time I've been in touch with people, everyone's been very friendly, very open and welcoming. And I very much look forward to meeting and networking with other members. So... What do you kind of do in your role as the president? Well, essentially, it's really about communications, making sure that there's movement and, and that the message is going around among the board members, that, uh, you know, when we say we're going to do things at our board meetings, that, you know, I give that little shove and make sure that so-and-so does what they said they were going to do. Mm -hmm. And... Um, and also um, communicating and doing what I can to get the word out there, contacting faculties where English is taught in, in different European universities and trying to increase membership, but also just making sure that uh, people are aware that this support network exists, that they are aware that we have these uh, events, that we have a, a workshop every second year on the odd years and, and a conference every second year on the even years. And that that anyone is welcome, anyone who's involved in the teaching of uh, English for law or legal English or English for legal purposes, its name is constantly evolving, can come and put forward uh, their ideas for a presentation or a round table and, uh, you know, thrash out any queries or doubts or troubleshooting or anything relating to our professional field. So essentially, yeah, the role of the president is about keeping the board together to draw up the agendas for the board meetings. Uh, we have a board meeting each time there's an event, so in, in September of every year, but we also have uh, a board meeting in the spring of every year as well. And um, you mentioned a little bit about that uh, Ulisa holds conferences, it holds workshops, and this year coming up there's a conference happening in Split? Um, yes, this year we're very, very pleased to have received the offer to host the uh, ULITA conference in Split. In fact, it's being co-hosted by two university law faculties, that is the uh, law faculty of the University of Osijek and also the law faculty of the University of Split. So yes, the conference will be taking place from the 27th to the 29th of September. It always kicks off um, in typical Ulita fashion with a, uh, a meet and greet event. As you see, that's our priority. Uh, we don't get into the plenary sessions before we've had a good chance to network, drink some wine, eat some cheese and olives and so on. So the Thursday evening is, is given to the meet and greet event and then the conference work um, proper begins on uh, Friday morning and runs throughout the day on Friday and not all day Saturday now up until lunchtime on Saturday so mm. it's a full day and a half of conference so presentations in parallel sessions um, some round tables some plenary speakers um, networking lunches on both days and a gala dinner on Friday night in, mm. in a wonderful, wonderful location in uh, a square in Split and then the whole conference wraps up with a cultural tour on the Saturday afternoon. So after we've had our final networking lunch and all the closing speeches and thanks and so on have been given, uh, we're going to be whisked off by our guides from the law faculty of Split University and taken on a boat trip to the island of Siovo and the, the historical town of Trojir well known among art historians and historians generally and those passionate about uh, historical places and that's how the conference will conclude is this, this wonderful fun event fun event fun exactly. event a fun bit event. of fun and a bit of legal english it sounds a bit like um i interviewed the uh, vice president of asia the international association for young lawyers and he really emphasized how that organization they 
have these fantastic events which are about learning and sharing information but then also the social side is equally as important and um, I haven't yet been to a ULISA conference but I'm very much looking forward to the one in September because it seems like it's got that kind of atmosphere that vibe about it that's networking is very important as much as the sharing of information as well so mm, absolutely and I think this is this is given um, more energy by the by the pure fact that uh, ULITA members are not uh, it's not an academic organization mm -hmm. and nor is it a professional organization um, so you might be familiar with academic organizations where there's a certain amount of competition you know how many publications have you got or where you know where are you going to publish this paper and so on and so forth ULITA is real a real mix of um, people coming from so many different origins and the academics that are there are in a sense relieved to be in an organization like this not to have to do the whole academic talk business mm -hmm. and there's a there's a whole lot of cross fertilization that, that comes from working with different people who are involved in in so many different levels of of the field that we're working in because yes it's not just a flat horizontal across academia um, type of profession it really caters for for so many different um, levels so this I think gives gives that um, added value that that sort of extra buzz to the the networking the fun the desire to collaborate the oh let's set up a uh, an exchange or you know let's share materials mm -hmm. or, or you know you can take some ideas from my course or you know we can replicate that in your town type of thing so very nice so you mentioned as well that you lead to a lot of the members they're not necessarily qualified in law they've sort of uh, throughout their career moved into teaching legal English. Do you have any tips for legal English teachers, maybe for those who don't have a legal background, for example? I think the key advice for the legal English teacher is really to know your audience, to get to know your audience as, as well as you can. Do what you can to perform some kind of uh, needs assessment and base what you're going to deliver on what your audience wants. Yes, it's true that language teachers who have no legal background do run up against this, it seems like a brick wall of, you know, a lack of, of knowledge. And of course, the knowledge of the law is immense. There's so much to read. There are so many cases that, uh, you know, someone who's quite advanced in their language teaching career can't go back to the beginning and do everything that a law student has done when they, you know, started at 18 and now they're in their 30s or 40s. Uh, so... You have to do what you can. You can work with legal material. Uh, language teachers obviously are sensitive and astute readers of texts. And one of the key things about teaching the law, not just the language of the law, is about interpretation. Okay, interpretation of words, how words are set down, in what order, the punctuation. So I tend to think of my role as, you know, someone who's come from the, the language background rather than the law background, as someone who has to try to refine students' uh, sensitivity in interpreting what is in a text. And that you can do with any kind of text. And if you start on a sort of journalistic current affairs text and then move into the more you know research papers in comparative law i think uh, a language teacher is perfectly capable of doing that without having all the background qualifications and so on that a lawyer will have likewise a lawyer will have their own difficulties when they come into language teaching i think maybe they will think gosh i don't have a clue about how to teach grammar and i don't know anything about linguistics or you know how to name what type that type of word so I think it's, it's, a, it's a good mix, really, when you have these two strands coming together. And again, you know, to underline it once more, this is why an organization that like ULITA, which is not just academic, not just professional, but brings the two together, it can really um, enrich the experience of both strands of teacher and, and can inform both um, and help them uh, uh, go a long way in their careers. Yes, yeah, so maybe if you have a legal background but not necessarily a, a teaching background and you're a legal English teacher or vice versa, you are uh, come from the linguistic side but you don't have the, the legal background, ULITA does provide that network that you can, if you've got a question, mm. you can uh, contact someone and hopefully get an answer. Yeah, that's and, right, that's mm -hmm. right. Um, you know, whatever type of situation you're coming from, you can be sure that someone 
in the elite organization has been through that difficulty mm-hmm. before has met that difficulty and we can put you in contact with them and you you know you can walk through it with them and you know how did you deal with that okay maybe i'll, I'll, I'll try it that way in fact it was to this end that we produced incidentally a trainer manual a few years ago that did precisely this it sort of went through a few testimonies of you know how did you come into legal teaching a bit like you've asked me and you had people from both strands and then sort of troubleshooted a few of the typical types of issue or obstacle that your new fledgling legal English teacher uh, tends to come across. Is that manual available anywhere? It is it's on the website so for for members of Ulita it is freely accessible at all times the, the website is uh, www.ulita.org. So for those of you who are interested in Ulita, finding out a bit more, you can go to www.ulita, that's E-U-L-E-T-A dot org, O-R-G, to find out more information. So David, thank you so much. It's been very interesting, very nice to talk to you today. Thank you. Thank you. It's been wonderful to uh, share the whole Ulita experience with you. Good. Thank you. So thank you for listening and see you next time.